Welcome again, and we are back. I know I said today was going to be our last day, but I remembered that there is something that I need to, to cover. So today is not going to be our last lesson. Next week, Tuesday, will be our last lesson. And it's, it's got nothing to do with Network Plus. I just felt that there are certain things that I didn't cover in this particular, um, you know, Network Plus course uh, that I thought is very important for me to cover. Uh, you know, discussing about you, your career path, what are the certifications that you need to start with, especially if you're starting your career in the IT industry, looking at getting into networking and other areas of uh, IT. And looking at 2022, 2023, uh, the proliferation of cloud services, what path works best? And I'm not saying that my advice is going to be the ultimate, but I'm just going to share my experience in the industry and the certification that I feel are in demand and the path that I would recommend. So if you want something in that regard, Next week, Tuesday, I'm probably going to dedicate a, a bit of time. Uh, I'm also going to share my story uh, so that you can be able to just pick up and be able to use this as you go along your journey. The objective is to try and help you as much as possible. And I figured that uh, there is the technical side, which is what we've covered in the last few weeks, but there's also um, the, 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 the practical side as to how do you navigate you know, the industry, uh, what skills are important. Uh, so I'm going to be looking at all those things in on Tuesday. Yes, on Tuesday. So today's lesson um, is going to be a very quick one because I've got some work commitments that I have to go and attend to. But I thought we're going to look at the tools. But instead of just talking about the tools, I want us to then look into the tools practically. So we're going to be looking at a few things. I will share my screen and then we will look at the respective right so let me just put my screen there we go okay so we're going to be looking at a few items and instead of looking and talking about them I thought to myself I'm going to put everything else on the screen and we're going to be looking at things practically and be able to see them working in real action. So we're going to be looking at the software tools that you can use in the in the industry to be able to do your job in a much better way or to enhance your job. So we're going to be looking at software tools. We're going to be looking at some of the commands that you can type on your own machine to help you navigate and understand what's happening with your network and what information you can get out of that. So that's the focus of today's lesson. It's under network troubleshooting, but we're just looking at all these tools that we can use. So the first one, without taking too much of your time, is Wi-Fi Analyzer. So when you're dealing with wireless issues, you want to see what other signals you know, are, are operating within your particular vicinity. And there's a tool uh, known as a Wi-Fi Analyzer. Um, I'm just trying to see Ekahau are one of the, the, the biggest players in that particular industry. So they've got their analyzers. Uh, sometimes they come in a, in a kit. And sometimes you, you use your iPad or your iPhone running the app. And the whole objective of a Wi-Fi analyzer is to be able to analyze the spectrum of signals that are operating within, let me just try and see. Yeah, man. All right, so you, you tend to get quite a lot. I'll just try and see if I can make the screen a bit bigger. Okay, so this is a typical example of a Wi-Fi analyzer that you probably get on the market. Like I said, most of them, they can run on iPads, they can run on your mobile device. Uh, some of them have specialized tools. You basically, turn on the analyzer, you walk around a particular area that you want to survey and scan, and it will come and give you feedback of the other SSIDs and frequencies that are basically operating in the same area. 
and how much interference is basically causing your particular network. So this is very important, uh, especially like I said, if you're troubleshooting wireless issues, uh, we I have used Wi-Fi analyzers uh, when I was working at a stadium and we had wireless issues. So we needed an analyzer to be able to do a spectrum analysis of the frequencies that we're operating during the game or during events and outside of events uh, so that we can then be able to you know, look at the two and see where our wireless issues were basically emanating from. So that was the one aspect. The second aspect was when we implemented uh, Cisco DNAC, the DNAC appliance, it also had an inbuilt um, capability to be able to analyze signals and frequencies, and it will then give you a very good report. So it's a very good tool. It's important for you to learn. I would encourage you, go online, go to your app store. You'll find a few analyzers that are available download one just scan you know the frequencies in your home area and see what you're basically getting i stayed in sydney uh, in apartments and my apartment was surrounded by multiple other apartments and imagine everyone else having a modem at home that was connecting to wireless my internet had issues and when i did an, a, a wi-fi analysis i was able to then realize that there were so many access points that are operating in the 2.4 gigahertz range. And I had to change to five gig. And when I did that, I got much better performance. So that will be able to give you the ability of analyzing and being able to see what is taking place. The next one is packet capture. Um, packet capture is basically, you know, being able to capture packets that are flowing on your network and being able to then analyze what is happening with those packets. Now today I always use I usually use packet tracer, but today I'm using GNS3, and I'm going to demonstrate how you do a packet capture, and then we're also going to be looking at that packet capture in Wireshark and be able to see the 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 what's flowing on the wire. You can do this by doing port mirroring. We spoke about port mirroring during the duration of the course, but I'm just going to do a simple network. I'm just going to have Two, two routers that I'm going to configure. And then we're going to capture the packets between those two routers and see what it is that we can be able to see. And I'm also going to demonstrate why Telnet is a bad protocol because people are able to snoop on what is happening and also Telnet does not protect the password. So this is my GNS3 setup. I wanted to do it from scratch so that if you want to do the same thing at home, you can follow through and you can also do without any issues. So just two routers, I'm gonna turn them on. And then I'm gonna go into console. Let me just console open this, make this a bit bigger. Appearance. Want. Okay, that's a bit bigger. And then we're going to console into this one as well. And I just need to change settings. Appearance, make that 16 as well, apply that. Okay, so I'm just gonna configure the first router. Interface FA zero slash zero. IP address, we're gonna give it 10.1.1.1, 255, 255. Five five dot that's dot two five two no shot. And then on the second one, I'm going to do the same thing. Conf T interface FA zero slash zero IP address ten dot one dot one dot one dot two 
255.255.255.252, no shot. Okay, so I assume my router should be fine. So if you're gonna do a packet capture in, uh, okay. If you're gonna do a packet capture in GNS3, you just need to right, right click the link. If I can select that and then do a packet capture, start capture. And then it's gonna capture your interfaces F00. Press enter. And then uh, it will open up Wireshark. It's opening up on my other screen. So it's gonna op open up Wireshark and then it's gonna start showing you, let me see if I can zoom this. Not so sure if I can, just a second. Okay. Let's make it a bit bigger. All right, so there is our Wireshark. As you can see, there isn't much that's flowing at the present moment. Probably just gonna make my screen, I'll probably come out of that so that you can be able to see much more better. Uh, yeah, so there isn't much flowing at the moment, but I'm just going to configure uh, Telnet on one of the routers, then I'm gonna Telnet into that router and we can then see more traffic basically flowing through. So for us to configure Telnet, it's line VTY. I'm just gonna do zero to five, login. I'm going to log in local and then transport input. I'm going to use Telnet. Yeah, okay, Telnet, that's done. Exit, I'm gonna create a local username called Cisco and password is Cisco, something basic, and then I'm going to use an enable password of Cisco. All right, so that's that. Uh, so that's on R2. So let's go to R1, and we're going to try and telnet from R1 going to R2. So I'm going to come here and then telnet to 10.1.1.2. And then press enter. All right, so the telnet uh, is, is opened. I'm asked for username and password. Username is Cisco, password is Cisco. And I have managed to log in. Now I'm going to stop our packet capture and then we're gonna analyze what was collected. All right, so I'm just gonna go up. So the moment I initiated the telnet, you can see that there was a TCP communication coming from 10.1.1.1 to 10.1.1.2. And we mentioned the last time that before TCP communicates, it does what is known as a three-way handshake, where it sends a SYN, gets a SYN act, and then an acknowledgement. And only after that has happened, you, you establish the, the session. And we can see our three-way handshake uh, that is happening on line 27, 28, and 29. And then after that, we find the telnet data then basically flowing through. So packet tracer, so not packet tracer, uh, packet capture allows you to see all this information and actually be able to see what's happening on the wire. Now, I wanted to demonstrate to you that telnet is not safe because we say telnet sends the password in clear text and anyone who intercepts the traffic like what we're doing right now is able to see the password. So let us see if we can find the password that we typed. We said our password was Cisco. And as I go through, I want you to, let's just look at the telnet data. Just a second. Right, there we go. Right, I want you to focus on the data that was being transmitted on, the, on this part. You notice that as we go from here, we find the letter C, the letter I, the letter S, the letter C, and the letter O. So basically our password has been sent by Telnet in clear text 
And if someone had intercepted this particular traffic, then they'll be able to see our particular password. Another thing that I want us to note on this particular aspect is the layer three source IP address is 10.1.1.2 to the destination of 10.1.1.1. That's the first aspect. The second aspect is the port number. Remember the last time we spoke about the OSI and we say that on the TCP layer, sorry, on the transport layer, we've got two protocols, TCP and UDP. And those port protocols use port numbers. And we said port 23 is the port number that is used for Telnet. And as we can see here, the destination port is port 23. So when you see port 23 traffic, it basically signifies that you are generating uh, Telnet traffic. So this is what you would find in a packet capture. There's a lot of information that you can analyze in a packet capture, um, you know, things like QoS, things like traffic markings, uh, things, you know, there's so much you can extract. I just wanted just to demonstrate and show you what a packet capture looks like and what is included in a packet capture. The next tool that we're going to be looking at is is a bandwidth test. And I think if I come here, oh, speed test, right. Uh, I'm sure many of you probably have conducted this before. When you're having internet issues and you want to figure out what might be the issue with your internet, you do a bandwidth test. And this just basically goes and talks to the server that either belongs to your ISP or servers that they trust and tries to measure the latency going to that particular server and what is your upload and download speed. So if you're suspecting that you're having bandwidth issues, you can use a speed test and that will be able to tell you, you know, your download and upload speed. As you can see, one that's running on my screen right now is just basically give me an analysis of my connectivity. Now with bandwidth test, The only thing that I, I I just tell people to be aware of is that sometimes the bandwidth test is being run to a server that's closest to your, that's hosted by your ISP. So sometimes you might get data that is not very accurate. So in this case, I'm sitting in Perth in Australia and this is running to a Perth server and it's probably running somewhere within 20 kilometers of where I am. And that might not be a, a very accurate perspective of my entire performance. So I can change the server and pick something else that is in a different location uh, to try and see if I'll get the same, uh, the same result. But like I said, it just gives you a very good indication of your download and upload speeds. And if your speeds are not running as per expectation, then you can then get an indicator at a much quicker point as to what you're dealing with. If you suspect you need to get in touch with the ISP, uh, you can get in touch with the ISP and, and you're able to then uh, ask them to come and have a look at your particular service. So that is the bandwidth test. The, the next one is an IP scanner. Um, an IP scanner, there, there are quite a few online. I've used Angry IP Scanner. Um, and I think I downloaded one. Let me just try and see if I can open it. You can download one of these and install them on your on your on on your computer, and then uh, okay. So the one that I downloaded is not is not running. What an IP scanner basically does is it scans your network and then it will tell you the devices that are online. And this is important when you are trying to survey a network that you don't know what devices are connected. So if you want to then you just do a, a scan and then the scan will be able to give you an indication. So it will look something like this. I, I would have wanted to run it live, but unfortunately, um, the one that I downloaded uh, is giving me issues, but it basically just scans your subnet and then it will come back with the devices that are live 
and devices that are that are offline. And that then gives you an indication of anything that you might want to check. I've used this, um, I've used this for daily checks uh, sometimes, where you can just get the scanner to run and then export the output of your IP addresses. And then you can then be able to tick against an Excel spreadsheet which devices you expect to be online and which devices do you not expect to be online. And if key devices that are meant to be online are not online, then it gives you a point of troubleshooting. So very handy. Um, you can use it for small use. You can use it in the corporate space. We also use them for if you, had, if you get someone reaching out to network team looking for an IP address to be able to configure a particular device or a server or a virtual machine. If you're not so sure, uh, you can either go to the DSCP server to try and work out, but the problem that the DSCP server does not necessarily give you what it doesn't know. It only tells you the IP address that is it is allocated. So IP scanner will help you to just scan the, the subnet in question, and then assuming what does not respond are the free IP addresses that are available for you to be able to configure. The other tool uh, is IPEF, and IPEF is a performance monitoring tool. And with IPEF, what it basically does is that it tests or checks the performance of file transfers between two different systems. So you configure it on a server and you run it on a client, and then you transfer files in between. And then it will tell you the speed at which you are transferring and at what capacity you're transferring. So if you're running a one gig link, uh, but you're transferring data at about 100 Mbps, then you might have congestion on your network because expectation is that at least you should hit thresholds of more than 500 Mbps uh, for that particular capacity. So when you're running IPF, you're basically trying to analyze the performance of your network and trying to see if you're, if you're having congestion issues. I have used IPEF, especially if you're testing performance between head office and remote sites. Uh, you have a client, you move a file, and then that can give you speeds of the one link. Or you can actually use it internally to the office where you just copy files from one server to another and just get a good analysis of how much bandwidth you're utilizing and at what speed you're basically running at. So that's one of the tools uh, that is available. And then we have terminal emulator. I spoke about terminal emulators in uh, <sighs> during the course. I think when we're looking at what you need to connect to what you need to connect to, to a Cisco device. Yes, you need the terminal emulator. And one of the most common ones is Party. And Party just allows you to enter the device that you want to reach. In this case, you can either put the IP address. Let me just uh, pick up something that's not as destructive. OK, uh, so this is my terminal emulator. So you put the IP address of the server that you want to connect to or the switch or router you want to connect to. And the terminal emulator will then connect to that particular device. So it's very important. It's not the only one. There is party. You also have secure CRT, which is what most people use in production environments uh, because it's got added features that you might not necessarily find in tools like party. But party is very sufficient. You can use it for consoling. You can use it for uh, SSHing or telnetting to a particular network device. So all these tools are tools that you need to have at your disposal and just have an understanding of what it is that they are able to help you to troubleshoot and help you to fix. The objective is having a tool set that you can pull out as and when you require that particular tool set. So that's the rundown of the software tools that are available. Now we're going to look at what's available on your computer uh, to be able to, to, to fix 
or troubleshoot things that are happening on your particular network. And remember the last time I spoke about the ping command, and I think I've used this command uh, so many times during the duration of this particular course. And this is my go-to command, and this is the go-to command for most people that work in the not only the networking industry, but IT industry, because ping helps you analyze a lot of things. And within a short space of time, by running this command, you'll be able to understand what you're basically dealing with. In simple terms, ping is a reachability protocol. Protocol, yeah, tool. What it does, it sends what is known as an ICMP echo request, and then it gets an ICMP echo reply. And by making a request and getting a reply, it's able to verify connectivity between your device and a remote device. And in the process, it measures things like latency, which is how long it, it took to get there and come back, uh, things like round trip. So there's a lot of information that you can get from ping. And in this case, we're just gonna ping uh, the famous 8.8 uh, .8 IP address, and we're just gonna analyze what has basically happened. So we sent an ICMP echo request, and then we got an ICMP echo reply. And this reply is saying that it the latency or the time that it took was 63 milliseconds. And then it also gives us what is known as a TTL, which is the time to leave. And we spoke about TTL and says, we, for every hop that you traverse, the TTL number is decremented. And when you get to zero, the packet get, gets dropped. So it's just trying to tell you um, the, the TTL. Let's see if we can ping office365.com. I'm not so sure if that domain exists anyway. Let's see, office.com. I know that one exists. All right, so you see that the TTL for this one is 122. So it has a different uh, time to leave. We also have other data that is very important for us to be able to then analyze with this particular ping request. Let me just try and see if I can, I'm just gonna take myself off the screen. Uh, so that we can be able to see. So I'm referring to four packets were sent and then four were received and zero was lost. And what this signifies is that there was no packet drops, which in a way confirms that my one link is intact and I'm not having issues. If I was having issues, you probably find that you might send uh, five and return three, and then you drop two. And when you see that you've got a number of drops, then it means that you probably have issues with your particular uh, network link. Uh, another aspect of ping is that you can run it with a minus T command, which means it can run continuously. And that allows you to gather more data you know, over a period of time. So you might run pings and sometimes you can run a thousand pings and then come back and see out of those thousand pings, how many were sent, how many were lost and how many were dropped. And that then gives you an indication of what you're basically dealing with in as much as your, your link is concerned. So I'm just gonna stop this ping and you're gonna notice that I sent 28, I received 28 and I didn't lose anything. So ping, very good command to be able to use it for that particular reason. The next command is ipconfig. Once again, we've gone through this command in detail, but I'm just gonna run through ipconfig one more time. ipconfig gives you the IP configuration of your device. You Not only does it give you the IP address, but it will give you the IP address, it will give you the subnet mask, and it will give you the default gateway. Um, on my machine, I've got so many uh, network cards, but the one that is of interest is this one. And as you can see, my IP address is 192.168.0.1. I'm using a slash 24 subnet mask, and my gateway is 192.168.0.1. This is just when you run the command, 
in a more basic manner you can be able to run it in a more with more com with more requests right so you can type ip config all and this one gives you more better detail uh not only will it give you the ip address but it will tell you the network card that you're running it will tell you the mac address it will tell you whether you're getting a dcp ip address and it will also give you when the list was obtained when the list expires the dcp server the dns so there's a whole lot of information that you can be able to extrapolate when you run the ip config command with the slash o and i've used this in production especially if you have jcp issues or you just want to verify you know which jcp server you're talking to and what your list periods are like it will give you that particular information the other um syntax that you can use so if you type if you config and press enter uh sorry what am i looking for ip config right if you type ip config and type the question mark you get other alternatives that you can use uh such as renew uh you can also do a release meaning you can release the ip address that you got from the jcp server and get another one or you can renew it the only problem is that i can't do it on my machine because if i do that i'm probably going to get disconnected and i'll probably lose this particular connection but the other uh, um extended command that you can run with ip config to be able to get uh different outcomes i would encourage you to give it a shot uh flash your dns renew your lease release your ip address and see how ip config basically works and allows you to be able to do those particular aspects and you can put that to test so that's ip config the next one is ns lookup i'll just clear my screen ns lookup uh, we spoke about ns lookup and we said we use ns lookup when you want to resolve uh either host name to IP addresses or IP addresses to host name. They're, so what the NSLOOKUP command basically does is that it queries the DNS server and it basically comes back and gives us information. So in this case, my DNS server is 192.168.0.1. So I can tell my NSLOOKUP command that I'm looking for google.com. It will come back and give me the IP address of 172. 217.67.110. So I'm doing a forward lookup because I'm looking for the host name and I'm looking for the IP address. We can do a reverse lookup where I can give it the IP address and then ask it to give me back the, the host name. And as you can see, it has basically pointed me to the actual server that is basically servicing that particular google.com request. So this is the typical case in point. You can run it in this context. The other feature about NSLOOKUP that you can do is use NSLOOKUP use NSLOOKUP but with a different DNS server. Right. So in this case, I'm using my home DNS server but I might want to use an external DNS server to do my lookups. So I can just put the name of the, sorry, the IP address of the DNS server. And in this case, I'm now using the Google DNS to do my resolutions and to do my resolving, uh, to be able to try and give me an answer that I'm looking at. The last item that I want to cover is that we say that there are authoritative and non-authoritative domain controllers, so the DNS servers, that basically give you a response. And in this case, what it's simply saying is that the server that gave us this information was not authoritative to that particular uh, domain in question. So in the work environment, this is very important when you're looking for an IP address of a server, but you only know the host name, but you don't know the IP address. You can be able to do an NS lookup of that particular server. So your NS lookup would look something like this, NS lookup, maybe oh sorry not even let's not even go there i'll scroll up and this is a typical case in point 
So I might know the server name, but I don't know the IP address. But when I do an NS lookup, I'll get the IP address. Then I'm able to then add a DP into that IP address and be able to do whatever I want to do in as much as configurations are concerned. Now, after we've done an NS lookup, the next one is trace, trace route. And we say that trace route basically traces your path from your source to the destination and the number of hops that you go through to get to that particular destination. And in, in the number of hops, it basically signifying the routers that you have to hop to get to your destination. And the syntax on a Windows machine is trace set. And we're going to trace the 8.8 um, DNS and try and see how we are getting there and how many devices do we hope to get to that particular device. And whilst it's doing that, um, remember the last time I said to you, RIP has got a hope count of 15. Any destination that's more than 15 hops, RIP basically drops that particular packet because it's too far a hop. That's the first one. Uh, in this case, the maximum hops are 30. And sometimes when you see request timed out, it's just there are some devices that are not transparent, meaning they don't allow you to be able to recognize their hops because they don't want to give out that information. So they'll probably come up as request timed out. So in this case, my PC went to my gateway. My gateway went to my provider, which is Optus. And then I jumped through a number of devices inside the Optus network. And then I exited Optus on this particular device, which then took me to 72, 14, 209, 126. Now, I want to show you something um, that is very interesting. And I'm going to use a command, not a command, but something known as a, a who is IP address. And this is, um, this is uh, very important when you're trying to troubleshoot who an IP address belongs to. So in this case, I want us to find out who owns this 172 IP address or who does it belong to. So we can go into uh, a platform such as this one. We can paste the IP address and then search. And when we search, it will give us the owner of that particular block of IP addresses. And in our case, that block of IP addresses belong to Google. So what this is basically saying is, we exited my Optus network and the next hop was going through Google servers. And these are Google IP addresses that belong to the, uh, to the, uh, to Google. Let's trace facebook.com. We can trace using the host name, uh, sorry, the fully, fully qualified domain name. So let's trace facebook.com and see what path we'll take, whether we'll take the same path or we'll take a different path to get to the Facebook servers. Uh, once again, very important uh, tool. You use that quite a lot. I, I use it quite frequently. Um, just especially when you want to, when you've got redundant internet links and you want to test which path your traffic is going. When you run a trace, it will tell you how it's hopping. And by so doing, it will show you the path that you're using to exit. So I want you to notice something. My exit point when I'm going to Facebook is different to my exit point when I'm going to Optus. Right, so I exit through a different path. And let us once again, uh, so this is an Optus IP address, and then this is a Facebook. I can see FBNW. So if I were to take this IP address, and then also search it in the who is list, I should come up with Facebook as the owner of that particular address. So who is, is a very important tool uh, for you to be able to you know, identify uh, who the who IP addresses belong to. So as you can see, this belongs to Facebook. So that's how you can be able to trace an IP address, especially a public IP address, and find out who it belongs to. So that is trace it. The next one is up. 
and up we said is it's called address resolution protocol that's not the command i'm just typing this so that we know what we're looking at so address resolution protocol and we said it maps the ip address of a device to its mac address so if i press enter uh type up dash a n o uh, up dash a i can get the resolution of my devices that are connected on my network and the responding physical ip addresses so this is my virtual infrastructure and these are my ip addresses on my virtual infrastructure and these are the physical mac addresses on those particular devices and it is important because sometimes you might want to troubleshoot i'll, I'll tell you scenarios where i've used uh this let me just bring back my face so that you can see me okay I'll, I'll give you scenarios where i've used this and how it has become in handy you might be looking for a device on your network you want to do a mac address lookup but you don't know the mac address of the particular device so you can ping the device and then when you ping your device when you ping the device in question if it's on the same subnet the mac address of that particular device is going to be cached in your app cache and then you can come and find the mac address and then you can go to your switch and look for that particular mac address to in to enable or enhance your troubleshooting so you might run across uh, one of those situations where you might want to implement it in that particular manner. In On a switch device, we use the show MAC address table command, but in a Windows PC, we use the app command to be able to get us the address resolution protocol. The next one is netstat. And this one, I, I rarely use it. I rarely use it, uh, but what Netstat basically gives you is the ports that your device is connected to and the ports that your device is listening to. So in this case, I've got a TCP connection between my PC and this public IP address on HTTPS, and that connection is established. So with Netstat, you basically use it mainly on servers if you want to verify that your server is listening why is this just was i don't know why it, is, it keeps on transitioning and changing the layout by itself anyway uh back to the the, the conversation so netstat basically allows you to see the the ports that you're connected to and the ip address that you're connected to and i've 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 used this when i'm testing server connectivity and i want to verify what ports the server is listening to i think when this Netstat finishes running, you'll see the uh, you'll see the the port that my machine is listening on, and sometimes for security reasons you want to restrict those particular ports. You can then be able to tie them down based on net Netstat, and sometimes also if you suspect um, your machine being compromised. Uh, Netstat will give you an indication because if your machine is talking to ports and destinations that you're not uh, you know, sure about, it gives you a very good indication. So I see that somewhere along the lines, I'm connecting to an EC2 instance that is sitting in AWS. So I'm getting that particular information. And then once again, the who is IP address becomes important. So if I want to verify who this IP address belongs to that I'm connected to, I can copy that IP address, come back, in the who is, and then I can enter that IP address and then try and work out who the IP address belongs to. And we're gonna find out just now, and that IP address belongs to Microsoft and my machine somewhere along the lines is connected to Microsoft. Uh, so that's probably not something suspicious, but if that was going to a domain that I don't know, let's pick another random uh, IP address and just try and see Let's pick this one and see what that IP address and who it belongs to. And that gives you a good demonstration of how you can use some of these tools on a day-to-day -day basis, or just try it in your home lab 
and and then run it, get the IP address, look it up, see who it belongs to, and have an understanding of how everything else works. Ah, okay. Okay, new relic, new relic. Neurelic.com. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, so this one is saying the IP address belongs to a company in San Francisco. Maybe one of the sites that I've opened, you know, is hosted in one of these platforms. Sometimes you get an IP address of a, of a data center that hosts infrastructure for many people. Uh, and yeah, you might not necessarily get the actual name like Google or Facebook or something along the lines. But yes, this is how you use the netstat command. Um, so, yeah. There, th these are tools that are there to help you uh, troubleshoot. And basically closing off, we're going to be looking at um, the equivalent on a Cisco router. And I, I've said this many times, and I'll say this once again. My favorite command on a Cisco device the moment I connect to it is show IP interface brief. If I'm connecting to a router, if I'm connecting to a switch, it's show interface status because those commands give me a very good summary of my infrastructure and what is configured. So show IP interface brief is going to give you all the interfaces, the interface, the IP address, whether the interface is up, the status, and whether it's down. So from there, you are able to then get a very good snapshot of what is configured on your particular device. So I always recommend people run this command. It's going to give you a very good snapshot of what is configured, what's not configured, what's running, what's not running, and then you can take it from there. The second one is show running config. This basically gives you the whole configuration of a Cisco device. What is configured in that device, you get a, a rundown of the entire configuration. Very important, can also be overwhelming because there's a lot of information that is basically contained in that particular uh, configuration. Uh, this is a bit lighter because there's not much configured, but when you run this on a production device, you might run through a number of pages of, of config. Um, it's very important, uh, very useful, but there are more, there are much better syntax commands that you can run to help you trim the output of that particular device. So a typical case in point is I can say show run interface FA0 slash zero. So basically I'm narrowing down my running command just to that particular interface. And I'm only going to see that particular interface because that's all I want to know what's configured on it and what is functional. I can say show run and I can pipe it and say begin on line. And I'm just saying, give me the line configurations or the virtual terminal configuration. So I'm only gonna get anything starting from line console zero, line aux zero, line VTY. Line console zero will basically be the console to the device. VTY will be our telnet and SSH and auxiliary will be probably something else. So you can narrow down. Uh, when you do CCNA, that's when you cover all this more in greater detail on which commands you can run on Cisco devices to be able to then give you what you're looking for. But you can run the whole show config, conf, conf, show config command and it will give you a particular output. And the last command is going to be show route and oh sorry show IP show IP route. And I say this command gives you the routing table and if you're looking for a particular subnet, if it's not in the routing table, it means that the device is not going to be able to forward packets going to that particular uh, uh, subnet. And you use this if you want to verify or you're having issues reaching a particular uh, remote location, you do show IP route and it'll be able to give you the routing table. So yes, today I've changed, I'm using GNS3. And as you can see, it looks like the actual uh, network device 
It's a much better emulator than Packet Tracer. Packet Tracer is very good, limited in certain commands. The thing that I wanted to demonstrate was Wireshark, which is the tool that we ran, which you can't run in Packet Tracer. Uh, you can run that in JNS3. So once again, All right, so KO, you're saying you've been having trouble subnetting with slashes. Hmm, interesting. Ah, uh, where do we start? I don't know. Yeah, I think you might want to look at the other videos that I might have covered. But what I'm what I'm going to tell you is, um, my email address is in the description below. Send me an email if you can attend the next class, which is on Tuesday, same time. I'll be able to go much in detail because Tuesday is just basically free flow talking about a lot of things questions like you know subnets and slashing uh, i didn't bring my monitor i didn't connect my monitor where i can write on the screen uh, otherwise i would have gone through a few examples but anyway we've got we've got a bit of time anyway so let's let's see what we can cover uh let's see what we can cover uh let me see if i can pull my slides on ip addressing and just do a quick rundown if not I will right. Where we, where we, where we, where we? Just bear with me. I'm just trying to get um, just trying to get uh, a few slides on IP addressing. I'm probably gonna bring that up. Let me do it this way. All right, I'm just orienting myself. I've just uh thrown in the presentation and now I've lost the screen. There we go. All right, so just quick rundown, three minutes. IP address, we know what it is. Identifies a device on a network, that is fine. We said, however, we need a way of being able to differentiate the host, I, the host address from the network address. The host address identifies an individual device. The network address identifies the entire network. We gave an example of a street and we say that the street name is equivalent to the network address. The house number is equivalent to the host address because it identifies the particular host. So that being said, the structure of an IP address, 192.168.0.10, it's made out of 32 bits divided into four octets. So that's not much of an issue. Now, where you're coming in is trouble with subnetting and slashes. So 192.168.0.0.254 is our IP address. We then said we need to know the network portion from the host portion. So what do we do? We use a subnet mask. So the subnet mask then defines the network portion from the host portion. So in our case, the first three octets, 255, 255, 255 is the network address. And because it's the first three octets and an octet is eight bytes. It means that eight, 16, 24. So the first three octets basically represent the first 24 bits of the IP address. Remember, an IP address is 32 bits, right? 32 bits divided in four octets. So the first octet is eight bits. The second one is eight bits. The third is eight bits. The fourth one is eight bits. So our subnet mask is 255, 255, 255, which means anything between 192.168.0, anything starting with the first three identical values belongs to the same network. And then 254 represents the host in that particular network. And we say that the network mask or the subnet mask shifts, it changes. It can be a slash 24, it can be a slash 16. Why is it a slash 16? Because you're using the first two octets, which gives us 16 bits. 
Now, coming to your question, KO, to say you have troubleshooting, so you have issues uh, troubleshooting um, with slashes. I'm just going to get to the diagram that I want that will probably be able to cover that in more greater detail. Uh, it's taken me longer to get to where I want to. There we go. Almost getting there. Right. So this is the most important diagram that you might want to learn and understand in as much as slashes are concerned. So remember, our subnet mask is 8 bits. Sorry. Our octet is 8 bits. Our entire IP address is 32 bits. So we say that when we are using the first 8 bits for our subnet mask, which is the value 8, we are dealing with a slash. We are dealing with a slash 8. When we're using the first nine bits, we are dealing with a slash nine. However, if because I'm 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 covering this rushing up a little bit, I'll just take a minute to explain one diagram. Right. Remember, we spoke about converting our IP addresses from decimal to binary. And we say that when you convert our IP addresses to from decimal to binary, we get the ones and zeros. And the ones and zeros are a combination of values that we are adding. So when we have eight, the, when you're using the first eight bits of the subnet mask, which I'll come back to this slide, and then I'll probably just explain from here. So when you're using the first eight bits, it means the first eight ones we're adding all those eight ones. And say the value that we get when you add all the ones is 255, which is represented by that subnet mask. But in this case, we have added a one because now we're getting into the second octet. And we said when you convert our IP addresses from decimal to binary, the first value is 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. When all those are added together, they give us 255. So when we borrow one bit, we get 128, which is a 9. When you borrow two bits, it's 128 plus 64, giving us 192, which is a slash 10. When you borrow three bits, we get 224 because it's 128 plus 64 plus 32, which is 224. 8 plus 3 gives us 11 because remember, you're getting into the third octet. So if you can get this table and master this table, you should be able to have a much better understanding on your notations. But once again, if you want me to cover this in detail, um, just send me an email and be in the class on Tuesday. And then I can then take you through this particular aspect. Uh, for now, uh, I have to wrap up. I've got some work that I'm doing at two in the morning at work. And I probably need to give myself a bit of time to rest and then be able to then go to work and get that done. But once again, you know, all is available. Any questions, uh, let me know. Um, my recommendation is try the tools that we've covered today. Get your laptop, do a ping, do a trace, do an NS lookup, do a net stat, do an up um, uh, resolution protocol, see what you can see, do IP config, see what is configured in your own device, where you're getting your IP address from, where you got your lease, when did you get your lease, all these things. I always, always, always encourage, try them, run bandwidth test, uh, download an, a Wi-Fi analyzer on your phone and run it on your phone, scan, you know, the wireless networks that are around you, see what it shows you. It's only when you do these things that they can become meaningful and they become tangible because you are going to encounter these things in a work environment. You are definitely going to encounter these things in a work environment. And before I go, I might not have covered one of these, but um, if you are if 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 you are serious about networking, I would encourage you to get one of these kits. Very very important. The the one important component I wanted to highlight 
in this is something known as a cable tester. Right, this cable tester, you plug in a, a UTP cable on this end, you plug it on the other end and it will run a test. It will tell you uh, if your cable is damaged or not. Um, so that's, that's, that's another very important tool that you need to have in your tool set um, as you basically go through with networking. But once again, guys, it's always a pleasure to, to catch up with you. And I'm looking forward to Tuesday. I've got a lot of things in store on Tuesday. Uh, I need to probably bring a lot of water. And because I, I feel like there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to talk about. And Tuesday is going to be focused on just everything about networking, everything about networking, Cisco, Juniper, Fortinet, Palo Alto, if you're looking at different vendors, we're going to be looking at cloud, AWS, Azure. We're going to be looking at security. We're going to be looking at what are the trends in the industry. When you're starting a career in IT, which direction do you go? Should you go security? Should you focus on cloud? Should you still focus on networking? Is there still value in networking? Because people are saying networks are going away. You know, are they really going away? I don't know. You know, we're going to have that conversation. And you know, whether you're in college, university, looking for a job. Where do you start? What jobs do you look for? You know, uh, we're going to be talking about things like CVs. What should your CV contain? What are the best certifications for you to do? Should you do CompTIA plus, Network plus, CCNA? Uh, you know, whatever else is 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 available on the market for you to go and do. What certification should you pursue? Security plus. There's a whole plethora of certifications that are available. If you chase all of them, you will learn nothing. You know, so that's the conversation that we're going to be having. So be sure to tune in on Monday, uh, sorry, Tuesday, same time, 9 p.m. AWST. <coughs> uh, let's have a conversation. But for today, thank you for tuning in. And then KO, get in touch with me. Uh, let's have a conversation offline and let's see how best we can, uh, you know, map out something. Uh, to help you with the slash notations in subnetting. So once again, guys, thank you for your time. I'll see you next time. <laughs>